I'm going to start out a little bit with um, some information about the virus because I think a lot of people are um, afraid. Uh, in, in some ways, they think that this is something that's so unknown and that we don't understand it and we don't know anything about it. And it's very, very scary to people. And actually, that is not true. Um, we know a lot about this virus. And so I'm going to start out with some basic information about the virus so that we can put everything in context. And maybe it's not as scary as, as people think it is. Um, this group of viruses, coronaviruses, were, were well known as veterinary pathogens. And so uh, veterinarians have been dealing with this uh, virus for a long time. Um, it was discovered in 1965 to cause uh, the common cold in humans. So that's kind of a good way to think about it. This is a common cold virus that has changed or there's a different variation of it, but it's still basically a common cold virus. And someday maybe it will be a common cold virus again when we have um, uh, immunity to it. But right now it's new and and no one has any immunity to it, and so it's causing a lot of problems. This is the structure of the virus, and you can see there's a couple of things in here that I want to mention. The first thing is those yellow um, little uh, bulbs or spikes on the outside. Those are very important because those little proteins um, are what the virus uses to enter the human lung cells. And if we have antibody to those, then it stops that, uh, that, that entry of the virus into the cells. So that's where all the research is going in terms of a vaccine and to some extent, some of the treatments. So the, the corona uh, means crown in, in, in Latin. And so the crown is those little uh, projections that are sticking out like the projections of a crown. And that's very important for this virus. And it's, it's actually going to be important in the future for vaccines and and treatment. The other thing is the uh, the bolded type there says membrane enveloped and that's very very important for for viruses because the membrane is very fragile and it's very easy to kill. And so people think oh it stays alive for a long time and it's so dangerous and we're going to get it, you know, in so many different ways. That is not true. It dies very very quickly after it leaves the body. It's very fragile. It's like HIV. And so it is easy to kill any uh, disinfectant, any soap, any alcohol will kill it immediately. So it's a very easily killed virus. It, it, it only stays alive outside the body for a short period of time. So uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, your groceries and, and merchandise that's coming from China and all of these things that people are saying because the virus is not that hardy. It's not like some other microorganisms like C. diff, for instance. C. difficile stays alive for a long time. This virus does not, and it all has to do with that membrane. The next slide kind of shows you the family tree of this of this family of viruses and, and it will place it in the context of, of where it belongs. There's a lot of, of uh, coronaviruses in the world and and the group of viruses that this fits in is in the blue part of the family tree. So if that's your um, your grandparents or your aunts and uncles, that's where this virus sits and particularly it will sit right about in the middle of the blue area. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but where it says SARS related coronavirus, that's where this virus is going to sit because it's very similar to SARS and uh, genetically. And so it's probably a version of SARS that, that has emerged. And that's probably when this family tree is redone, um, that's where this virus is going to sit. And it's very similar to a bat virus. Maybe you've seen that. That's been on NPR, right? Uh, that this virus is um, is probably came from a bat virus because if you look at the genetic sequence of this virus, it's very similar to a group of viruses that live in bats. So if you if we want to go back to the very very original source of this virus, uh, you know, uh, back farther than Wuhan, China, uh, it probably came from a bat cave somewhere, um, and 
and, 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 it, and it, it emerged into the human population in some way, and that's probably the origin. And maybe it will go back to the bat population. We don't know, but that's where the virus lives and what it's what it does. What the what the virus, how it infects the cell. This brown box here represents a lung cell. I know they don't really look like that, but uh, in terms of a diagram of how the virus uh, causes the disease, it enters, and you can see there's the picture of the nice coronavirus with the spikes on the side, and it attaches to this this uh, receptor here that lung cells have, and then that receptor pulls the the virus into the cell. The, the virus then replicates, makes copies of itself with our own uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and, and it goes through the Golgi apparatus just as if it was a, a, a human protein, and then it makes these copies of itself, and then it spreads. And then when it, when it leaves the, the lung cell, then it becomes contagious, right? Uh, because our uh, our lung secretions are going up the, the trachea to the nasopharynx, and, and that's where they're contagious, where one person can cough or sneeze or, um, you know, uh, uh, rub their nose or get nasal secretions on a surface and then cause another infection. So that's the life cycle of the virus. So what does it actually do? It's a pneumonia. It's a lung infection. It doesn't cause runny nose. It doesn't cause watery eyes or anything like that. It doesn't really cause diarrhea, although some people get, um, you know, gastrointestinal symptoms. That's not where the virus is replicating. That's not where it lives and is probably not contagious by that route as well. So it's a pneumonia. It's in the lungs. And, uh, and, and if you look at the spectrum of the disease, about 80% of all sick people, that doesn't reflect people that are asymptomatic, but 80% but of the disease is mild to moderate. That is, you'll feel, you know, kind of headachy and sick and have fatigue and you'll have uh, a little bit of shortness of breath and and a, a low-grade fever, and the fever tends to be intermittent. That is, it's not the same all day long. Um, one case that I just read yesterday, uh, the person you know was describing what what it felt like to have COVID disease. And he said that his disease, his uh, fever would go down in the morning and it would go up in the afternoon. So it, it's it's an intermittent fever. It's not the same all the time, which means if you want to check somebody for COVID, you really have to check their temperature more than once a day uh, in order to catch that intermittent fever. Fifteen percent of the people require some kind of hospitalization. And generally, that means oxygen. Uh, that is, they, they don't feel like they can get enough air into their lungs, and they require some supplemental oxygen. And so those would be the type of patients that we would have in our uh, general medical unit in the hospital. And then 5% have a, a kind of an unusual or a unique um, a complication of this, and it's called ARDS. I, I don't know how many people are familiar with that. If you're not in the acute care environment, you, you might not uh, uh, see those kinds of people, but it is acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, and that has to do with the fact that your immune response your inflammatory response in your lungs kind of goes crazy. They call it the cytokine storm, a storm. That is, you have huge amounts of cytokines, unusual amounts of cytokines that are produced in, in your lungs, and they cause a lot of damage to your, your lungs. So it's basically the patient's own inflammatory response that's causing the damage. And those people end up in the ICU. They end up on a ventilator, and they they generally don't do well. Now we have we have uh, you know um, uh, extubated patients that have been in our ICU and they've recovered and they've been sent home. But if you have the people that have the um, uh, the fatal response to this infection, those are the ones that have that uh, that severe lung damage uh, that that is difficult to manage. So that kind of explains uh, where the virus lives and what it does to your body and and why some people survive and other people don't. Um, underlying risk factors. 
there are some that are very quite well known. We knew this in China, you know, very early in January, it was clear that this virus affected some people more than others. And the ones that developed the uh, disease as distinct from, you know, mild or asymptomatic cases had some very important risk factors in common. And the, one of the most important things is age. Your risk of having a bad outcome or more severe disease goes up every 10 years. And so I'm, I've got a graph coming up showing you that. The second one is heart disease. And I'm not exactly sure other than the fact that if your lungs are not working well, that's harder for your heart to pump your, your blood. And so with any kind of um, uh, lung disease, you also can, can have heart problems because half of your blood is always going through your, your lungs. And so uh, heart disease is a risk factor as well. Hypertension, uh, same reason, diabetes and lung disease are all risk factors. So if you look at the people that are not doing well with COVID, they generally are older and they have one or more of these risk factors and they're cumulative. So if you have more than one, um, that gives you a, a higher risk and, and, and a, a worse, worse outcome. There's definitely a, uh, a sex difference and it does not favor men. Men are the weaker sex, as we all know, and that is true for COVID as well. Um, it's, it varies somewhere between a 45-55 uh, ratio to a 40 to, to 60 ratio. So, so males predominate. Um, we don't know whether that's because of a higher incidence of underlying risk factors or because men just don't like to go to the doctor uh, or, you know, what that, that, that uh, particularly means. But um, we don't necessarily think it's genetic. It might be something else, but but the incidence so far is higher in males than in females, and the highest incidence is in African Americans, and that probably has to do with the underlying risk factors because all of those things, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and lung disease are more common in the African American uh, male population, and so they are they have all the risk factors, and they tend to predominate in terms of the incidence of hospitalization due to COVID. Here's the graph that I just told you about that is showing the relationship of age with uh, fatality. And this is also uh, clear for um, uh, hospitalization as well or admission to an ICU. You can see that children are, are almost never um, uh, exhibiting severe symptoms. They're, they can they can carry it. They can have some mild symptoms, but they're almost they, they almost never die of it and they're almost never hospitalized for it. And then starting at around the age of 40, it seems to rise and it, and it like doubles every every 10 years. And so the older the, the person is, the uh, the more at risk they are. That could be because of age or because of the accumulation of those risk factors as we all get older. So I'm in one of those high risk groups and so I'm taking good care of myself and it's something that we all need to be aware of because we're in the business of care of seniors. And so the population that we care for is in one of those higher risk groups. And so we have what we call a vulnerable population just because of age. And so we have to take special care uh, to prevent this infection from getting into our facilities. So there's the, uh, the challenge for us. How is it transmitted? I, I said it was is a respiratory virus. How do viruses get into your respiratory tract? Well, they basically, um, now there's a couple of ways. The first way is on your hands, because if you touch something that has the virus on it and then you touch your face, you have the virus on your mucous membranes and they'll end up in your respiratory tract. And then the other one is more direct. That is, if somebody sneezes or coughs on you and you get their saliva or their respiratory secretions in your eyes, nose, and mouth, then you can directly take that virus into your respiratory tract. So we think that the, the contact mode of transmission is the most common. That is, you get the virus on your hands and then you touch your face. 
The um, the other is not uh, probably so so important. You can spread it from person to person, but the hand uh, hand to face is probably the most common way that people are getting this coronavirus. One thing that it is not it is not absolutely not airborne. Some people say that it is. It is not airborne. So if you hear somebody say that, uh, you need to correct them. And if you think that, then that's something you need to get by because it does not stay suspended in the air like tuberculosis or something like that. It's almost always something that you touch with your hands and then touch your face. The transmissibility generally correlates with symptoms. So if you have somebody with a high fever and uh, a lot of shortness of breath and so on, they're probably transmitting and shedding a lot of virus. Uh, and, 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 and the transmissibility, it looks like it starts a couple of days before symptoms, which is a problem for us, right? Because that would be asymptomatic transmission. So a couple of days before the patient's fever uh, starts, they have virus in their nasal pharynx and they can spread it. And it lasts about seven to 10 days in most people. And the more symptomatic the patient is, the higher the symptoms, the more ARDS and so on, the longer uh, the patient sheds the virus. So people in the ICU are shedding more virus than people in general medical uh, units and so on. So, so the, uh, the, the transmissibility tends to follow the, the symptoms from a couple of days before until four or five days afterwards. I guess I forgot to put in here the incubation period. That is the time period between when you're exposed and when you get symptoms. And, and most studies at this point seem to say that the average is around four to five days. So if you trans, if you got the the infection on Monday and, and and you acquired it, today would be a day that you would expect to have your first day of fever. So it's around four to five days incubation period, and the last two days of that that would have been then, you know, Wednesday or so, uh, you might have been transmissible um, uh, for that virus. So that kind of relates to the issue of prevention rather than waiting until somebody is, is, uh, is uh, symptomatic. We have to do the right things now before somebody is symptomatic because they could spread the virus the day before they're symptomatic. So this relates, this slide relates to a concept that we're using a lot in education called T-zone. And the T-zone is your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. And that's how respiratory viruses get into your body. And so if you touch your T-zone with your dirty hands, that's how you get the virus. And so if you keep your hands away from that, uh, then you won't get the virus. Now, where am I going with that? Well, I'm going to face masks because the face mask covers your nose and your mouth. And if you use glasses, and or eye protection and you don't touch your nose and your mouth and you cover them with a face mask, then that reduces your risk of transmission both from you to somebody else and from some other outside source to your body. And so we do recommend using face masks um, uh, when we're in you know areas that are uh, public areas or when we're with other people closer to six feet, uh, we recommend using face masks masks. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy about that. And uh, the White House has a position on that and so on. And, and, and some people do it and some people don't. But it really does work. And one of the reasons it works is that it prevents you from touching your nose and your mouth. And so we do recommend the use of face masks as protection from COVID. It doesn't have to be OSHA, uh, you know, approved respiratory protection. Anything that covers your nose and your mouth is adequate for that. Diagnostic testing has really evolved. You know, that's kind of an area that I've that I started my career in. I'm a microbiologist, and so that was that's been interesting. And and, and it used to be when when COVID first came out that there was one laboratory, one room, one bench in the whole United States that was doing the testing, and it was in Atlanta at the CDC. And then they started doing the test in state laboratories like Michigan. 
and then uh, different manufacturers of uh, laboratory instruments that we have in hospital laboratories started to do the test. And so now we have multiple uh, instruments, platforms as we call them, or machines that will do the COVID PCR test and many hospitals have these. Some still don't. If it's a very small laboratory, they might not, but they usually have a relationship with a, a larger lab that will do this test. And so the Bronson uh, Laboratory started doing this test last week. So we have the ability to do in-house tests. It's called a PCR test. What is that? A PCR test is called polymerase chain reaction. And it's not a test for the, the whole virus. It's a test for the viral RNA. So it's just a piece of the virus. And so if you have viral RNA in the specimen, it will pick it up. It's a very, very sensitive test. If there's virus in the specimen, it will pick it up. Now, the issue is not everybody has virus in their nasopharynx. And so you can take a swab, and, and, and if the patient is not shedding the virus, the test will be negative. But it's not because the test is bad or because the test missed it. It's because there wasn't any virus there. And no test will find something that's not there. And so the nature of the test is that if the virus is there, the test will find it. But not everybody who has COVID infection sheds the virus in their nasopharynx. And so you can have a false negative nasopharyngeal swab. So the specimen is a nasal pharyngeal swab. Uh, some of these tests will also do other specimens like, um, you know, tracheal aspirates or uh, a bronchoalveolar lavage or something like that. But the standard test for everyone, outpatients and, and, and inpatients, is a nasal pharyngeal swab, uh, which is way, way back in the nasopharynx, right? If you've ever t taken one, uh, it goes about five inches back into your nose. So it's not just a nasal swab it goes way way back to the back of your throat and so that's the specimen uh, shedding and test positivity is highest around the time the fever appears and then it goes down afterwards so as the pa as your fever appears your inflammatory response starts your immune response starts and the viral load goes down what that means is that the the first uh, test that you do as soon as the fever appears is the most likely to be positive and after that the likelihood that you have a positive goes down so most people are saying uh, don't repeat a negative test it's not going to turn positive later unless you have a new infection but if it, the first test was negative then repeating the test a couple of days later is more likely to be negative not positive uh, the, the the virus doesn't you know grow um, it, it declines after the the fever appears and so you're on the wrong side of the curve if you keep repeating tests on patients uh, that have negative tests so people with mild to moderate disease who test positive go down after the early peak and most people that have COVID are negative by the PCR test around day 7 or 10. So if you have somebody that wants to keep testing and testing and testing somebody because you don't agree that they, they don't have COVID, then you're just wasting your time and your money because the, spe the patient is not more likely to turn positive, they're more likely to turn negative as time goes on. So that's kind of my, my soapbox about, about testing. Um, there are some new serology tests. Maybe some of you have heard about those. They were really in the news these days because a serology test doesn't test for the virus. It tests for the patient's immune response to the virus. So it does not tell you whether the patient has the virus. It tells you whether they had the virus in their body and they made an immune response. And that's very valuable uh, because if the PCR test is negative and you still want to test the patient, then it's been, you know, a week or two since the patient uh, first had their, their symptoms, you might be able to do a serology test, which might pick up a, a positive, maybe not, but it could pick up a positive that the PCR test missed. You can also screen asymptomatic people. Maybe some of you 
saw all the stories. Uh, Beaumont Hospital in Detroit is going to screen all of their employees uh, next month and find out how many people actually had COVID and didn't know it. That is, they were asymptomatically infected. And we think that maybe it's, it's maybe double the number that were symptomatic. So if you take all the people that had symptoms, um, there's twice as many people out there that never had any symptoms and they had COVID and they didn't know it because they had no symptoms. So from that, you can calculate the attack rate. Now that's going way back to your college days, right? The attack rate. What is that? Well, that's the, 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 the percentage of people that get the disease that have been exposed. That's the attack rate. So the serology test um, used for populations might be useful for a number of different, uh, a number of different reasons. And those tests are coming to the U.S. market now. So we will soon have serology tests that are FDA approved. Just a word of warning, um, there are some that are FDA approved and some that are quite good, but, but this is a, an area where a lot of bad scammer companies are coming on the market. You know, we have a test for COVID. You know, it takes a drop of blood and you can do it at home and you can do your saliva and all this. Don't believe it. There's a, there's a whole lot of, of companies that are going to get sued um, or go out of business because they're scamming the population. So go to a reputable laboratory and get a reputable serology test because there are a lot of companies out there that are making fake uh, serology tests and, and people are buying them and because uh, and, people are scared, right? They want, it, they want an answer. And so the, any answer is, is better than none. So they do these fake serology tests and it's really g uh, getting to be a problem. So uh, make sure that you, you use a good one and you know how to use it if you, if you decide to, to look at serology. Treatment. Uh, treatment, there's a couple of things that work and one that probably does not. Uh, one of them that works is called remdesivir, and, and it's a drug that was actually developed for Ebola, and it has activity against SARS. And so we think that it's probably going to work for COVID. It's in, available as an investigational drug now. So your, uh, your hospital has to be enrolled in an investigational study in order to get it. But Bronson is. And so we will be getting remdesivir and we can use it in our patients. And it looks promising. Uh, initially, we don't have, you know, controlled, uh, randomized controlled uh, uh, trials on it. But we have used it, not Bronson, but the people have used it. Uh, in different patients, and they seem to improve. And it does not seem to cause any toxic side effects. Um, uh, the, another one that, that works, or that probably works, is immune plasma. Maybe some of you have uh, seen this, and it's become also very uh, popular in the media. If you've had COVID, and uh, uh, you've recovered, then you probably have antibodies in your blood, right? Well, then you could maybe donate those antibodies to somebody who has COVID infection. And so the protocol is that uh, 28 days or a month after you've recovered from COVID, you're eligible to participate uh, in, in, and be recruited uh, into a registry, and, and you can donate your plasma through plasmapheresis at certain plasmapheresis centers across the state, and your immune plasma can be used to treat up to three additional patients. So we do, uh, we are participating in that program in Kalamazoo, and so we will be recruiting, or someone will be recruiting our recovered COVID patients to do this plasmapheresis uh, protocol and donate your immune plasma to be used as a drug for people um, that might have COVID. Um, uh, the, the one that I also have to mention is hydroxychloroquine, and, and that's the one that, um, you know, the White House is saying is so great, and, and clinical trials show that that drug does not work and that it's very dangerous and very toxic and causes lots of heart problems. And so uh, people who have, have started it have stopped it, and so it's just uh, it's not considered to be a good option, and, and uh, so I would, I would stay away 
away from that drug. Even if patient want if patients want it, it's not something that you should probably consider or be very uh, aware of the ethical considerations there. You may well uh, do more harm than good by by doing this. And, and what position does that put you in? Uh, you know, we can have patients sign an informed consent, but an informed consent does not completely cover you in terms of legal liability based on what we know about that drug. So I would be very careful about doing the um, hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment approach that, that a lot of people are talking about. Okay, vaccines. There's at least one vaccine in development, and it looks like it probably would work. Um, they, 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 they probably will, will have uh, a pretty successful vaccine because we know what the antigens are for this uh, virus. And so if you already know what the immunogenic antigens are, it's fairly straightforward to produce a vaccine. And this, of course, would be a game changer because then we would be able to immunize susceptible people and protect them against this disease. Uh, normally, it takes about 18 months to bring a vaccine to market, but of course, everyone is focusing on this, so, so it's likely that the FDA will go as fast as they possibly can. If they have a vaccine and it looks safe and it looks effective, um, they're going to want to bring this to market as fast as they can. So don't be surprised if sometime in 2021 there is a vaccine or some vaccine trials and um, and we'll have vaccines uh, to do that. Should everyone get them? Well, we don't know. You know, will there be some sort of a prioritization to those patients in high risk groups? Probably. Um, would there be prioritization to healthcare workers? Yeah, probably. Um, and, and then we have the uh, uh, serology test, so we know people who are already immune, and 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 those would probably not need the vaccine. But uh, but you know, people who are essentially Essential workers and healthcare workers uh, and, and, and vulnerable patients who don't have antibody would certainly be great candidates for this vaccine. So I'm hopeful that there'll be a vaccine sometime next year. Control, uh, I mentioned early on when we were talking about the virus that is easy to kill, uh, and, and that's true. So normal um, healthcare disinfectants that you would use every day in your facility, we use a lot of quat, quaternary ammonium compounds, because they're very safe and they're very effective. Um, you know, they're not toxic or anything, and they, that kills the virus very easily. So normal environmental cleaning kills it. Uh, bleach, if you, if you have to, but it's not necessary necessary. Uh, so any any sort of detergent, uh, alcohol cleans it very well. So you don't need, uh, you know, uh, excessive uh, cleaning regimens in order to uh, get rid of this virus. And again, it doesn't survive long on surfaces outside of the host. It lasts for hours, not days. Of course, there's a lot of social media out there saying that things that are shipped from China are contaminated and you can't touch them or we have to wipe down all our grocery you know, when we get back from the grocery store, um, that's probably not necessary. Anything that's been sitting overnight is probably uh, uh, dead. So I, I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on that. Cleaning is always good, but, but remember you want to clean high touch surfaces because it's your hands that are going to be the, the source for this virus control. How do you take care of patients with coronavirus? Um, well, it's contact and droplet spread. Remember, I said it is not airborne. So, so gloves, gowns, a procedure mask, and eye protection are what we use for routine care. And we like these face shields. I show a picture there of a face shield because it covers your whole face. So if somebody coughs or sneezes in your face and you don't have a face shield, you know, you still get some of it on you, whereas the face shield will catch almost all of it. And so, uh, we kind of like the face shields. They're more comfortable to wear th than goggles, and you can see through them pretty well. And so we're using a lot of face shields um, in the Bronson system, and that's kind of our our go-to eye protection now rather than the old ugly goggles. Uh, they do say that you need a particular respirator level protection for aerosol generating procedures and that would be either a PAPR or an N95 respirator but that would be only for aerosol generating procedures and those are not very many and so uh, if you're not doing aerosol generating procedures with a, a machine that makes an aerosol uh, then you don't need that level of protection. 
many people are very confused about what an aerosol generating procedure is. And I've heard healthcare people who should know better saying that a patient coughing is an aerosol generating procedure. No, it is not. You need a machine to produce aerosols. Uh, so, so something like a nebulizer, uh, a machine that produces small particles like aerosols are necessary to produce uh, those, those small, very small aerosol particles and patients coughing doesn't produce aerosols. So uh, if that's something that you're confused about, you should probably clarify that because you could make some really bad decisions if it's not clear to you what an aerosol generating procedure is. Because we've seen that in the hospital. People think that some things are and they're really not. So what's what's going to happen in the future, or how does this all end? So this is a famous graph. I think it might be from University of Michigan uh, that an epidemiologist did this, and this is a nice graph to think about. Uh, if you don't have this in your in your documents, you you might want to use this because it it this 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 you know it really explains what we're doing. So what we have here is the um, you know on the 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 vertical axis the number of cases, and then and then the horizontal access is time. So this is the epidemic curve. And the red one is the one you don't want. That's what happened in Detroit. In Detroit, we exceeded the healthcare system capacity. Um, that that is, we had way way more patients um, uh, in, in in last month that the healthcare system could could effectively take care of in Detroit. What's happening with the blue line there is what's happening in West Michigan. That is, we instituted our social distancing and our wearing of masks, and you know we we kept people away from each other and made them wash their hands and clean their environment and we never exceeded our healthcare system capacity yet i don't i'm not saying never but we haven't yet we still have hospital rooms we still have supplies we still have icus we still have ventilators all of our patients are getting optimal care so the blue curve is what we're doing in west michigan and the red curve is what happened in new york and so on when they exceeded their capacity so the point is if we do the right things we can keep that curve very low and, and make it very long and maybe all summer long, uh, but we can keep this uh, epidemic under control instead of it getting out of control and then lots of patients dying. So that's the, the standard um, flattening the curve uh, diagram that you should keep in your mind, and it explains everything that we're trying to do in the state of Michigan and at a county level to control this epidemic. So if we do that, um, well, I think you know we're going to have a, a long long uh, dealing with this virus. This virus is not going away, by the way. Some people think it's just going to go away, you know, like flu or whatever, and everyone will just get over it. That is not true. We're going to be dealing with COVID for a long time, probably years, until we have a vaccine. It's not going to just go away this summer. It's not going to go away at the end of April, you know, or, or, or something like that. Uh, we think we'll be dealing with COVID for a long time, probably all summer into the fall. And so it's not going to go away. We have to learn to live with it as the new normal. Um, just a little bit of a review of the story. Uh, I know I'm, I'm running up against time here. I remember that the first report was on New Year's Eve, December 2019, and that's why it's called COVID-19. Uh, if the first case was reported on January 1, it would be COVID-20. <laughs> so that's a fun fact right there. And the, the presentation was a febrile uh, a viral pneumonia in Wuhan, China, and it was first uh, identified uh, in an area where there was a farmer's market, a, a wild animal, a, what we call a wet market in, in, in Wuhan. Now it's questioned, you know, that might not be the, the original source. It might have been around before that. Uh, but anyway, it's a nice story. And so they're saying that it probably came from some sort of an animal source in, in Wuhan, China, which is probably true. Whether it came from that market, who really knows? 
Um, where is Wuhan? If you're not familiar with your geography, you know, I knew where some cities were in, in China, uh, Guangzhou and so on, but I didn't know where Wuhan was. So there it is. It's right in the middle of China. It's a very highly uh, populated city. And so it's south of Beijing and north of Hong Kong. And so it's, um, it's right in the middle of China. And that's probably the epicenter of where this thing uh, arrived or, or emerged back in, in January. And, and, and I say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And I think that that's true because something very, very similar to uh, COVID happened in 2001, and it was called SARS. Does anybody remember SARS? Uh, it, it happened, and it was very similar similar to this, except that it went away. And so it spread across Asia and so on. Uh, eventually, it went away in June. And that's kind of interesting because this drug, remdesivir, was was actually brought out or developed to handle SARS. And then SARS went away, so the company put the drug on the shelf because they didn't think that they could they could market it, and which was true. And so they made a business decision to stop development of that drug. If they had continued the drug development, we would have had a drug already to treat uh, COVID, but they didn't, and so now we're rushing the drug back into production so that we would have this. But the order of magnitude is much, much smaller, right? I mean, it's thousands of times uh, smaller than COVID. There were only about 8,000 cases and only about 800 deaths. But this actually did happen before. So oftentimes in infectious diseases, if you look at something that's happening now, if you go back in history, you can find something very similar to it that that already happened, and that can sometimes help you address those issues and answer some of the questions. So this is the world map as of yesterday in terms of the number of cases that we have. And, uh, and, and, and right now, the United States is the epicenter of SARS, no longer China. Most of the cases that are occurring in the world are now in the United States because we didn't learn from the Chinese experience in January and we waited too late to respond to it. And so now the United States has more cases, more hospitalizations and more deaths than anyone else. And that was unnecessary because we knew what we needed to do, but we didn't do it. We thought we could just close the borders and keep those Chinese people out and we would not have a problem. And of course, that's never, never true with infectious diseases. And so if we had acted early, then perhaps we could have prevented some of this, uh, but we didn't. And so here we are uh, in, in the COVID area. I wanted to mention one more topic in, related to infectious disease epidemiology, and that's the super spreader idea. And it probably explains a lot. That is, most of the cases who are spreading COVID are probably super spreaders. The average patient does not spread very many virus, but some people do. They sneeze a lot. They 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 uh, you know they cough a lot, and they have a lot of virus in their nasopharynx, and and they spread it easily. And so the the concept of of wearing masks in public and washing your hands is basically to control these super spreaders and and. They then uh, we will probably have fewer cases. So not everyone spreads the virus to the same degree, but if you can control your super spreaders, then you're probably going to be able to control the virus. So um, think, remember that when we talk about spreading of the virus and who needs to be controlled. We need to target those super spreaders. Will it go away? Well, I've given uh, both sides of this argument, right? I sound like an economist now where there's two answers. Uh, maybe uh, most respiratory viruses are seasonal and they go down in the spring. And so the vi uh, weather is probably on our side. Uh, all epidemics decline when the susceptible susceptible population can no longer support the outbreak. So if it turns out that a lot of people were asymptomatically infected and they have immunity, this virus is going to go away. Uh, if that's not true, then it might stay around for a while. So we have uh, limited the virus to some extent, certainly where we've done social distancing and so on, and eventually vaccines will be coming and the virus could mutate and go away all by itself. So those are all factors that you would say, well, maybe, maybe this is going to go away, but maybe not. So
also um, um, uh, the virus doesn't always obey the rules, and so sometimes they don't go away in the summertime. Uh, most of the world still doesn't have immunity against COVID, so we still have a large number of susceptible people. A lot of countries, particularly, were worried about Africa, don't have a good healthcare system, so it, it could uh, emerge and surge there as well. It's difficult to get people to change their behavior and do what it takes to prevent this infection. And you only have to look at Lansing, Michigan yesterday uh, to notice that. There's a lot of people who are, um, you know, either inadvertently or deliberately doing high risk behavior just to kind of show off and uh, and express their opinion. And, and that's going to work against us. And, you know, the virus could mutate. It could get better, but it could also get worse. So mutation goes both ways. Uh, it, it doesn't always get better. So there's my both sides of the story that maybe it will go away and maybe it will not.